we could uh we could uh, record for six hours and then just keep chopping down to get the best bits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey everyone, it's Charlie Marr. And as you guys could see, I have a very special guest. Um, it's Evan Blecker. Is, is it Blecker or Blaker? Blaker, actually. Okay, because I've heard, I hear everyone say Blaker, but I've also heard some people say Blecker and it looks like Blecker. Um, <laughs> the people who don't know how to pronounce it say Blecker, so. It's Blaker. Blaker, yeah. Yeah. It's those and damn Dutch you names. Are, what was that? <laughs> it's those damn Dutch names. They're never pronounced. Uh, oh, is that what it is? It's a Dutch name? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Evan is the author of uh, Benjamin Graham's Net Net Stock Strategy. And you're also the founder of the Net Net Hunters, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Net Net Hunter.com and uh, Net Net, or Benjamin Graham's Net Net Stock Strategy. That's correct. Awesome. Yeah. So I, I already told you this before, but like, the funny thing about the book is, um, I'll just repeat it again for the people. I I, I found your book. I, I've been familiar with with the strategy, um, and you know there was this one time where I just wanted to look into like to see if there was books because not a lot of people talk about it. And all the books like that are out there, not a lot of them break down like you know literally break down things. So I remember right. just typing in like deep value books or like deep uh, net net investing and like I don't remember what I did but I eventually came across your book and yeah. I'm pretty sure when it was coming out it actually said like two months like, it, like it's coming out in two months and yeah. I think I pre-ordered it. long story short I, I bought it I, I read it absolutely yeah. loved it you know it's like one of the closest books probably the closest book I've read to things that I like to my approach uh, of investing and I, I gatekeeped it like I did not want to share the book <laughs> with anybody I because you know, I don't know. It just, it, it, it breaks it down very well. Um, right. So yeah, that's probably a bad thing about me that, you know, I had your book for the longest time and people would always tell me like, is there a book? Is there a book? And the book that always popped into my mind was that one. I was like, Benjamin Graham's net, <laughs> but I never <laughs> wanted to tell them. Uh, but, yeah. You know, eventually I, I, I realized after like, like, no matter I've gone, you know, I have a group as well, as well. And right. I've got, there's been thousands of members like over the past few years and I've, I've really came to the conclusion that like, it's a really hard thing to do. Like Seth Carmen yeah. says, I mean, you really are going against nature. Um, I'm pretty sure out of like all the members that I've had, like maybe just 50 or 40 of them, like really follow through it. And be, be within those, then you have to divide the ones that are actually successful in it. So I started to loosen up more and like be more, I'm sure I'll, the viewers are like, yeah, we've seen lately you've been, sharing a lot more than ever um but yeah I just realized it's so hard you know you really have to have a strong a strong stomach and yeah. the right temperament the patience a passion right. for it um yeah so now I'm just like just yeah, it's like Bob says, it. you know it's uh it's like inoculation either it takes or it doesn't and yeah. um it's that's definitely true with value investing but then net nets and uh we'll say cigar buck sorry cigar butts more generally it's just it's a harder thing to take so it takes a special kind of person who sees these terrible companies in a lot of cases that are you know sales have fallen off a cliff and their prices or their stock price is down 90 percent or you know it takes a special kind of person to look at that and say what a bargain <laughs> yeah <laughs> right they're just, they're just saying so, that says something like the stock market is the only place that people run out of the store during a sell or something I yeah think. yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah but uh, yeah. yeah for for our membership as well i find that um we've had a lot of members cycle through and there's some people that really get it and understand it and stick to it the, over the long term. There's others who look at it and just freak out right away when they realize what I'm doing. And then there's others who, you know, maybe they like it for six months and they find something else shiny and then they run off to do the new strategy. So I think that's something that I've faced a lot. Like, you know, I'll, I'll buy this set of stocks that I love and I noticed that like, you know, like after if, there, if nothing happens in two or three months, like they're like, they're so done with it. Like they're over yeah. it. Like they something new pops in and like, they just, they're like, nah, this is so much better. And like, they just keep hopping around so much. And, you know, right. that's when it, evidently they end up with really big losses or just kind of give up in the market. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's unfortunate. But yeah. you definitely do have to block out a lot of the noise. Like 
I'm there. I'm right there with you. I'll invest in a stock and people are like, oh, this stock has been falling for the last five, 10 years. Like, why would you buy it? And like, they make no money. I'm like, well, first of all, it doesn't really, it matters and it helps, but it doesn't matter if they don't make any money. Like we're buying the assets. I, I guess yeah. that's what different, like is different, you know, about the approach is that we're focused on the assets. We're not necessarily buying the future cash flow or like all the money coming in, you know? Um, right. And people just don't understand that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, looking at the assets is definitely key and that's, you know, eff effectively what we're buying. And if you just swap, uh, you know, a lot of people buy earnings are like, well, this, this company can earn, you know, two bucks a share <clears throat> year in, year out. It's growing, you know, that's great, but swap that same idea with net assets. And you're like, well, this, this company has a new net assets of two bucks a share and it's growing over, you know, year over year. That's effectively what we're doing. So it's just that um, earnings is, uh, works as a bit of misdirection, I would say. You know, it takes people's focus away from the true source of value. It kind of uh, sends people running or sends people to the shares. So, yeah, I, I always people don't really like it when I say, but I always tell them like it's it, 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 for me, it's still speculative because you have to hope that the company continues to perform that like on average you know growing that right. rate and selling you know yeah, nothing interfering so like to me it's like uh, i don't know and with our strategy is like we don't care well a lot of the times i don't care what it does in the next five or ten years i'm not even going to hold it that long i don't care what it did in the past like it's worth this much now as long yeah. as it's been very um like consistent and it's not diluting yeah. shareholders like high burn right. rate or anything like there's right. money to be made. Um, and then I, you know, Brinson repeat that method. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, um, I don't know. I hope so, but have you seen other people's money with Danny DeVito? Yes, I have. I love that movie. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's my I really favorite love that movie. movie. It, I, it, I love it because it's the only movie out there that, you know, he's the, the scene where he's breaking down the numbers. Yeah. Like, I absolutely yeah. like, relate to that so much. Yeah, I was like, this, 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 exactly this. <laughs> yes. Um, that's funny. I wonder if they kind of got inspired by Warren Buffett, because I think Warren Buffett, um, he he did that. Like, he went through that exact same thing, and, like, it didn't make him, he said it himself, like, it didn't really make him any friends in that, like, city or that small town, because he was trying to liquidate them, or, or he did liquidate them. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's that's what we're doing. You know, we're we're, we're looking at the assets, and, yeah. you know, we're on top of that, we're adjusting them or discounting them and then paying back all the liabilities, you know, making straw sure that and there's money leftovers for, for investors. That's the liquidation side, the salvage liquidation value. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Other people's money was, was really good. Um, not a lot of other movies that talk about cigar butts or anything like that, but yeah, I, I think I'm going to add that to our um, resource section for under uh, recommended books. I'm going to put down that movie because that really <laughs> it's, explains it's it really well what we're doing. So, yeah, I don't, yeah, I can't name another movie that, that does that. Well, um, going back to the question, because <laughs> we can <laughs> talk about things forever. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, oh, I guess for the people, um, can you just, and I mean, I guess we're kind of already talking about it, but can you give a brief summary about what your book is and what Net, Net Hunters is? Yeah, sure. Uh, my book really is a, um, it's a piece of work that I put together uh, over far too long, like it took me two years to write. It's not that long of a book, but um, it, it basically breaks down what net nets are, um, the studies and, and the findings behind them. Uh, and then it goes through different rules that I find uh, or I've found practical, you know, over the course of 10 years of doing this. And then it talks about um, the net net or cigar butt approach, approach of a few of the gifted pros like, you know, Graham, Buffett, Contill. And then it gives some, some examples of net nets that I've uh, purchased and what's happened since. So it's a very, very practical guide if you want to get into this. Yeah, I love it. I mean, like I told you earlier, I was trying to gatekeep it from people because, I, I mean, it pretty much breaks it all down. And it, I, I guess I didn't want the competition out there. Um, but then I also did realize, like, you know, you do run into a lot of different stocks. And then you run into all the people who think they're doing it, but they're not picking necessarily the right stocks. Um, yeah. like they really are picking the value traps, I guess. Um, yeah. So yeah, over time, I just learned to just let it go <laughs> and just kind of share it. Um, and I, 
with ex- you know realizing that not most people are just not going to commit to it. Yeah, I mean, a key part of the book is talking about the qualitative aspects of um, picking these stocks. And I don't come out and say explicitly, you know, you need to add the qualitative aspects, but it is part of the scorecard. You're looking at, you know, share buybacks, insider buys, catalysts, you know, something that's going to change the situation. So, yeah, that's very, very important, I think, for helping to sidestep value traps. I was, I was actually, now that you brought up about buybacks and like insider ownership, does that affect you in any way when you see like, um, f- for example, I'll buy stocks and, and people will, will literally like put it on my face. I'm sure you're, you're aware of what to do, but um, they'll be like, oh, like even insiders are selling this stock. Like you're dumb. Like they obviously know something that you don't or, um, or they don't even like not even them own it like enough of it. Like, you know, they, they won't own like a lot of it. Um, do you, does that have any play with, with, with what you said? Yeah, and no, I mean, not really. Uh, Peter Lynch said it, you know, um, insiders will sell for many reasons, but they only buy for one reason. They're buying to make money. So, you know, that the an insider buy has far more significance than an insider sell. And I think that, you know, um, investors often look at sales as, you know, being indicative of a bad situation, but, you know, insiders, they have families, you know, they want to buy a house, they want to go on vacation. So they sell the stocks um, that they get through uh, exercising options or sell the options um, just as, you know, part of their salary. That's what they do. So, um, you know, that's how they get paid. So I don't really pay too much attention to that. Uh where it does factor in is if everybody starts selling big blocks, you know, uh, within a tight period of time, all the insiders are selling and selling most of their stake, then you should probably think twice. But, uh, you know, aside from that, no, not really. Uh, as far as insider ownership goes, you know, I prefer if there's some ownership there because, you know, then there's a personal incentive to make sure that the company does well. But, um, uh, I, if if a company has you know very thin insider ownership, it could still be a great buy. Uh, so I wouldn't count that against the sock. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. There's a, I think it was Joel Greenblatt, um, another guy. I absolutely love that guy, uh, who said that like even sometimes directors and like CEOs and insiders like sometimes like it, it, they're clueless sometimes about their own stock and their own assets. Like you know they yeah. just focus on the business. Um, right. but even like they made mistakes and stuff. Cause I always tell people like I've bought stocks, like where they were literally getting downgraded, like nonstop, which to me was an advantage because it was getting cheaper. Yeah. Um, insiders were selling and like just a lot of negative news. And that's like what everyone was telling me, like, no, like, why would you do that? I just got downgraded. And some of those were like the ones that brought me the most returns. Um, right. so yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, uh, what was, what was I going to ask? Oh, yeah, about the NetNet Hunters, because I kind of cut that off. But. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, NetNetHunter.com <clears throat> is a website that I actually, invent, uh, actually set up for my, to help with my own investing. So, you know, I was inv- initially investing just in U.S. stocks, and I was doing pretty well, you know, early 2010s. And eventually all those U.S. net nets started to dry up and I really had nothing much to invest in anymore. So it was, um, you know, I was facing a situation where I either had to do something or buy something or abandon the strategy altogether because there's nothing to, um, to invest in. So one of my friends said, well, why don't you set up a website that helps people find these? And then, you know, you can pool the cost of, um you know hunting these stocks internationally so i thought that was a great idea that's what i did and um you know put together uh, a list of international net nets um which was fairly pricey (laughs) but uh you know we had the subscribers there to help share the cost and and then everybody started emailing me um and so i was you know on my email two hours a day and i thought this is not sustainable so I ended up making um, making uh, a little uh, forum so people could discuss, and it's just it's just grown from there. So yeah, so that's basically what NetNet Hunter is. And then we have uh, investment resources, we have analysis. Um, yeah, so quite thorough now for anybody who's really dedicated to this stuff. Yeah, yeah, you have a great community. You know what's funny? Like I read the book, and I I read 
about the NetNet Hunters, but I didn't go into the website or anything, but it was, I don't remember what I was doing, but I was looking into playmates, which I, yeah. I know you guys have talked about. And that's actually how I came across NetNet Hunters. Um, right. And then I, I saw the name and I was like, wait, like, I was like, I have his book. And then I was like, wait, that's the <laughs> website. So I came across you guys because of playmates. And, and funny enough, playmates was one that made me a good amount of money. Um, I, I, I personally bought in like, I think within like two months, it had like a nice run. Um, yeah. And then I ended up selling, I took my games and just ran, which is something that I do often. Um, and yeah, that's how I came across you guys. And then I started, um, I joined the community myself, actually. <laughs> yeah, three, I think it went up 3x in six months or something like that. Yeah, that was, that was quite a nice stock. Yeah, I personally, I think I sold it for like 84, 86% gains. So I didn't yeah. really ride it that long. But I don't know, I have this weird thing where like, how do I, like, if I think a stock is valued at 10 bucks and it's at five bucks, so, you know, a dollar for 50 cents, I guess. And then it runs to like seven bucks. Um, Most times, like I'm, I guess I'm evaluating where my money is better off at that time. And sometimes I find another stock that, you know, has the same potential. Um, So like the returns left, I guess, are not worth it for me. So that's kind of where I'll leave it and move on to the other one. Um, yeah, and I just kind of reset it, I guess. I think that we think very similarly uh, about these type of things because you know this is just what I've been thinking about this year. Actually, you know, a lot of people they want the ten xers, and you know, they see a stock that's gone from one to ten, for example, and they're like, "Wow, if I just bought it at one and then rode it all the way up to 10. Now, if you buy that stock at one and you ride it up to eight, now you've gotten most of the returns possible, right? And so. Um, you know, these are, these are uh, cheap stocks for a reason. They're not your uh, Buffett's moats, right? They're, they, they have a rocky uh, sort of, you know, history. So to go from eight to 10, the return on that is very small comparatively. And you may have um, a good, good chance of falling from, you know, eight back to one. So you have to really look at your risk reward there and say, okay, well, you know, if I can only go up 20%, but I can lose a lot. And then I'm looking at this other stock and this other stock, you know, maybe it's not a 10 X, but it can double, but you know, downside is very limited. That's the obvious course to take in my view. Yeah, yeah. That's something that I think that's like a big part of the reason why I make the switch apart from like, you know, I have, I reset it. So I have the full potential to make, you know, the, the bigger return is yeah. that I get to put my money in a place that's at below close to or at you know net current asset value right um and and, you know that's that's what's constantly in my head is like where could i put my money where like i can lose the 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 least amount of money and a lot of the times like i'll go into a stock knowing that it could go down further or that it will go down further but like i'm okay with that downside i'm like okay it could go down another 15 20 percent most likely will but yeah. you know that is like the limit, not the limits. It can continue going, but you know if they were to liquidate, like it would close yeah. around that range. So I feel very comfortable going into a stock like that, and you know that's that's kind of what I think has helped me a lot. It's it's I mainly focus on not mainly, but a big question I ask myself is like, it's not so much how much I can make, it's how much could I lose, yeah. um, and right. you know I just kind of drag that on. And keeping that in mind, you know, when people ask, when should I sell? When should I sell? And, you know, a lot of people say selling is the hardest part of investing. Well, the answer is opportunity cost. I mean, that's really come what it comes down to. Do you have a better opportunity that you should be putting your money into? Right. Well, then you sell and you put it into the better opportunity. Right. Yeah. That's so. funny. I have like a, I have like a little like web tree that you kind yeah. of ask questions. Like you, you're holding a stock and you ask yourself questions and eventually you lead to one. And like towards the end, that it, that's that's one of the questions. It's like, was there a better stock? You know, that kind of like what I said, like it's at, you know, dollar for 50 cents instead of a dollar for 80, like the one you're already holding. And if that's right. the case, then like, you know, maybe you should consider selling and, and making the switch. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> I was also going to ask you, like, I don't know, maybe this is just my own world. Because I, I don't hear many people talking about it. Um, nothing special or anything, but it's the difference between net, net, uh, current, net current asset value and net net working capital. So right. for me, like a net current asset value is, you know, just the current assets, just the, the normal definition, but 
the equation for net net working capital isn't it isn't it exactly the same but the only difference is the like the discount so you're adjusting those current asset about like the, those current assets um i've gone back and i've read uh you know after my i i thought that way before i wrote my book and then you know in, during the course of writing your book you're also doing a lot of research and um, you're writing things that you thought you knew, but you actually didn't know. And so you have to go and you have to learn a lot about it. Um, so one of the things that I looked at was, uh, was net networking capital. And I was reading a lot of Graham and Buffett. And it turns out what they were doing is, yes, they were discounting the current assets, but they're also including the fixed access, at, sorry, <laughs> fixed assets. Um, in that equation. I think in a couple of examples, Graham, uh, I believe he discounted them by half. So he says, you know, or 70% will include 30% of the fixed assets to our calculation. Um, I think Buffett did something similar though. I think he might've taken a more market uh, approach and said, what are these assets actually worth if sold on the market? And so what I've come to is that your net current asset value is just the straight um, accounts from current assets, less total liabilities, less preferred shares, off balance sheet stuff. So that's fairly straightforward. Um, the net net working capital, uh, you have to discount the current assets. Um, and I try to do it basically by, you know, how Graham did it um way back in the day even though accounting's a little bit different now yeah um and then i look at the fixed assets and i say okay well what are these actually worth in the market because if the company has you know a piece of property um then you don't want to necessarily discount that 70 percent because you know there's readily um available markets for property um you know, the value is pretty known. Another thing is shipping. You know, when people talk about uh, shipping, uh, talking about like ocean ocean carriers and stuff like that, you know, a bulker, I mean, there's people are selling bulkers, you know, all day. <laughs> and so you can go, you can go online and uh, you can just see what the transactions happened at over the last month. And, um, and so you can get the exact value of some of those assets. So that's what I try, try to do with uh, net net working capital. Um, it's not as conservative as net current asset value uh, because it includes the fixed, uh, the fixed component. But I think maybe it's a little bit more accurate. Um, yeah. It's just another yeah, way I always had it like the other way around. I always tell people like I make my own, like I have my own definition for stuff. Like, <laughs> like when the difference between like fair value and intrinsic value, like I separate them, like it's weird. Right. But uh, yeah, for me, like it was always like you have net current asset value, um, yeah. which you know it's just a straight up number. You don't, and then the net net working capital is it, it's still the only current asset value, so you're not bringing in any of the other stuff but it's just discounted. And then, you know, once right. you, you discount those line items, then you come up, I don't know, if it was net current asset value of two and now you have 120, like yeah. if the stock is at that or below, then it's a net networking cap or net networking capital. That's how I always thought um, it yeah. was. So I don't know. That's, I don't know. Well, that's the most conservative way to do it, right? So if you're discounting your current assets and then you're not adding fix, fixed assets into that, you know, obviously, you're going to end up with a more conservative valuation than just net current asset value. But I think they were, they were taking in uh, fixed uh, assets into the calculation. So, um, and that's a change for me, you know, two years ago or three years ago, I didn't think that. So, um, but yeah, that was, that was actually thing the... that you, sorry, go ahead. No, you can go. Cause was, it's another question. Oh, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, another thing that you, that you find out when you start doing a lot of background research on this is that, Buffett and Graham, they're a little bit fuzzy on their definitions of what a cigar butt was and a net net was or a working capital stock was. So you really have to piece it together from a bunch of different sources and make certain assumptions. Um, so yeah, not, not quite as simple, uh, but everybody who knows net current asset value who's kind of in the deep value space. And it's the one that's been studied and um, by all the academics probably probably because it's the easiest to measure you know it's really easy to come up with an exact uh value for these companies because you're just going off of 
yeah, I always tell people like like valuing them is the easiest part. Like I could value Absolutely. the company in two minutes, five minutes if I wanted to. It's you know the hard part is once you have ten or eight of those that you like, it's now choosing one, knowing how much to add into them, and like you know you know then you want to dig deeper into them to see which one's the better one. Like that's what or, yeah. or the long the longest part is denying so many of them. It's like you're saying no to so many of them, which I guess now it's a little easier with filters. Yeah. Um, and going back to the Buffett thing, that's actually kind of how I kind of, you know, came across, I don't want to call it a secret, but that's kind of how I came across it. It was, I spent so much time reading his letters to shareholders. I have the book that has all of them and like a lot of his videos and you are right. Like you have to piece it together. Like, it's not like he's has an hour video talking about his exact ways, like early Buffett, but, you know, in certain meetings, he does, you know, someone brings up a question and he'll kind of answer parts of it here and there. Um, so you have to kind of grab like a minute or two minutes from an hour long thing. And I like kind of put them all together and you, you can see, you know, the early Buffett type of stuff. And like, kind of like you said, I don't even think he, it was kind of fuzzy for him. And for me, looking at it from an outside perspective, like seeing, how they got to their billions and how they made, you know, their many millions, like I can, I see the path. And then that's kind of where I was coming up with this. I call it the three stage theory and like, you know, investing mm. two millions and it's, you know, the smaller amount of money you have, like you want to spend the most time with this really small market cap stocks and looking at only net networking capital, net current asset value stocks. And they're the most boring, but you know, that's where you'll make the most of your money. Um, and, and then, you know, Seth Klarman also, I think even Seth Klarman kind of started noticing it, that I, you have, like, you evolve through it, and yeah. I, I've noticed a lot of people just, you know, they're so focused on what Buffett does now, and, yeah. you know, but it's, it, you know, it's different, because he's managing billions and billions of dollars, so it's like, you know, not trying to f- do what Buffett is doing now, and, like, even what everyone else is doing, and, like, you know, Seth Carman, and Charlie Munger, all of them, like, I think it's a mistake. If you're trying to grow, you know, make, achieve really high returns, I think it's a mistake. If you're just settled, I guess, if you're just chill where you are, and you're okay, you know, normal average returns, then, then, you know, you'll still make money. You know, you could maybe achieve millions, but I do think it can take (laughs) decades to achieve that, which is a turnoff for people. Um, I wrote an article called Have You uh, Fallen Into the Warren Buffett Trap? And it basically talks about all of that. It's, uh, you know, people today (coughs) trying to model, um, you know, what Warren Buffett does, you know, buying compounders, you know, the compounder bros and all that stuff. Um, But you're not Warren Buffett and you don't have the same ability to pick uh, great stocks. You can't see moats as well. You can't assess management as well. But on the other hand, you can do basic math. I mean, you can add and subtract, right? So you can find out what the net current asset value is and buy below it. And then if you go one step in, if you go from, you know, grade three to grade four, (laughs) elementary school grade three to grade four, you can even see that they're doing share buybacks. And then you're like, well, maybe I have to, maybe there's something to this. Yeah, it's uh, slowly increasing the the value. Yeah, I mean, if, if we're talking investment strategies and we're looking at difficulty level or um, ease to apply. The net net strategy is definitely, you know, in the early grades of, you know, primary education, whereas Buffett is a master's degree. So uh, that's really what it comes down to. That's the difference. And I think a lot of people spend time, I mean, not just trying to pick moats and compounders and all that, but they're, they're buying these giant companies and thinking that they have an edge over professional investors who you know, spent their lives doing this, have a team of researchers, have MBAs, you know, Um, they've read all the same value books you have, probably more, Uh, where's your edge, right, where's your edge, and then there's a lot of, um, a lot of people don't recognize that uh, size is a massive factor in investing, not just your portfolio size, but the company size, so you can have, you know, two companies trading at, you know, 50% of book, or say 50% of net tangible asset value. One is a million dollar company, one's a, you know, a billion dollar company. The one that's a million dollar company on average will do way better just because it's smaller. Yeah, exactly. so, yeah, that's yeah and where, those, little, those little differences add up 
<laughs> like, you know, people are always talking about long-term where it's like, well, if you're adding those extra little gains that you make over a year, like you're compounding way more than you'll ever do following these guys. I, Absolutely. I made a TikTok video talking about that. I was like, Apple, Facebook, and, you know, just naming a bunch of value stock or not. It's weird because a lot of people would call these stocks value stocks. And I'm just like, those aren't value stocks. Well, I just <laughs> in my world, like, they'll yeah. be like, oh, Facebook right now. Like, it's a value stock. And I'm like, I, I, I guess you can call it a value stock. But like, I don't consider it a value stock. Like, I think early buff, like, you know, old school. Yeah. Um, I made a video talking about that. Like, that is not how you achieve, like, many millions, like, in, like you know, or high returns. Um, and I was talking about how you want to focus on the smaller cap stock, all that stuff. And Phil Town was calling me out on it. Like, just kind of, <laughs> yeah, I was like, what the heck? <laughs> he made a, like, a YouTube video, like, reacting to the videos. And the comments absolutely, like, obliterated, like, destroyed him. <laughs> because yeah. they were kind of like, I don't know, I guess, um, I guess he judged me too soon, too fast, just based on TikTok videos. And it's like, just a couple, like, a minute max um so like I guess he didn't get the full story but yeah and it's crazy how even like man I'll, I'll get into some arguments and stuff here and there with like people that are running hedge funds or like professionals with huge titles and I'm a CFA and like man all this stuff and it just blows my mind how sometimes they don't even get it and I'm like man right. having a title really just does not mean anything like you can have a title of any kind and do it like I don't know being really high ledge and like you can still be an idiot <laughs> interesting story one of my friends was on a plane back from Omaha and he was sitting next to I think it was um Ella Schroeder uh and he said and she, she's the uh the author of Snowball for anybody who's watching this doesn't know Snowball is the giant biography about Buffett and you know they got to <laughs> talking briefly and she's like oh yeah what do you do and he's like oh I, I invest in net nets she just kind of gave him a blank stare like for a couple seconds and then she's like Oh, cigar butts. Yeah, those don't exist anymore. It's crazy how people <laughs> say that. People always tell me that, like, it's dead. They don't exist anymore. I'm like, no, you just don't know how to find them. That's a, right. there's a big difference. And, you know, maybe in the U.S. it is harder because it is, it is harder to find them in the U.S. But, like, yeah, going outside of the U.S., like, you have a whole different world. And you do have so many stocks. It's a bummer because sometimes I find stocks that are like in the Malaysian like market or Indonesia that I actually yeah. love and I just can't invest in them and I'll see them get bought out and all this stuff. And I'm like, no, there was this one stock. I didn't even buy it. And I, I actually, I was able to buy it called IO data device. They yeah, were, yeah. I, they were, they were a great like little stock and they ended up getting bought out and like for 60, 70% higher than what it was trading for. Um, yeah. I made a whole video. That was one of the first videos I ever made breaking down like, the math and like why I believed it was worth more and it was cool to see it get bought out and people were like oh like we get it this is what you've been doing this whole time um but yeah that's that's pretty crazy let's see if, uh, <laughs> oh. any other questions here well one of them was if you ever go a step further yourself well I guess before that, I was going to ask, do you personally diversify? And I guess that's a hard question because, you know, to everyone, it's, I don't know, diversification could be different numbers, but do, do you buy a basket of these and follow that old school, like Ben Graham thing where you're buying 30, 40, 50 of them, or are you just honed in on like your top ideas? Some of the best investors I know have baskets, but personally, that's not what I do. I think that you can be very, very flexible in this uh, one aspect and crush it either direction <clears throat> the difference is that if you have a smaller uh tighter portfolio of like say four to ten stocks uh you're going to have a lot of volatility whereas if you have 40 to 100 stocks you know it's going to be a lot more smooth sailing for your portfolio generally speaking um yeah i know i know people are crushing it either way me personally i like to stick to a 10 stock portfolio but admittedly, I'm finding that very difficult in this environment because there's so much to buy, so many, um, you know, great cigar butts, you know, trading out there. And it's really tough for me to kind of <clears throat> pick and choose which ones are better than the others because they all look like great opportunities. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, 10 stocks for me, uh, if I go down to eight, I start feeling a little uncomfortable. If I go up to 12, I start feeling a little uncomfortable. So yeah, it's like yeah. Perfect and, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for me. And I know that you you invest in just a handful, right? Yeah, I think that like 
I start to feel uncomfortable when it's above like six, like six or seven sometimes, but like usually the seventh one, I only own like 2%, 3%, like a smaller amount. Right. Um, and a lot of times like I'll focus on the top three. I guess it's kind of like a challenge because if I come across like 10 or 15 that I just love, like I really have to compare them all and like try and choose the best one. And yeah. I guess the fact that I own less of them, it helps me stay a little more on top of them versus like, oh, I need to keep up with eight, like eight or 10 for me. Um, so I kind of like to just keep it smaller, but it is very volatile. And I guess that's part of the unattractive part, like where you do have to have the right temperament and the, a strong stomach. Cause I've seen my whole net worth drop like 30%. And like, to me, it doesn't phase me at all. Like I, I can lose 30%, 35%. Like I have my, like my head's focused like on where it's headed and yeah. but people go crazy over that like I've had people yeah. laugh at my stocks that they're down 25 percent I'm like that is so normal for me like I'm yeah. most stocks I buy go down like for the for a while before yeah. they go up um, it's just um, but people up. can't handle that yeah and, and you're right yeah the long the more stocks you hold the more like this more stable it is but you know by me like if you're already holding 30 40 20 stocks you might as well buy an etf the way i see it <laughs> um well so, yeah I, I mean you said it. it's a lot more work too right i mean if you have to keep track of 50 stocks i mean how uh, can you keep track you know, of 50 stocks <laughs> yeah that's what is that one every six days or something like that i don't know it's too early to do math for me but you know <laughs> like, what's but, yeah right there? Yeah, it's, uh, it's tough. Um, you have to keep up with all the news, all the different filings, you know, make sure you update your numbers. You know, 10 stocks is about, you know, my, my comfort level. Also, um, you know, the level at which I'm not willing to do really more work. <laughs> yeah. so. uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's, it, it's very similar. It's just the, the timing is different. Like if I only own four of them, like yeah. it, it might take, six eight months or up to two years for one of them to actually play out but yeah. i'll see that huge kick on my portfolio when it's playing out but yeah. if you are holding you know 10 or 15 maybe you're not seeing like maybe you are seeing some of them play out a lot sooner but obviously yeah. since it's spread out so but at the end of the day i feel like they're it's the same like you're still growing very similar like maybe um i don't know it's kind of hard to explain but I, didn't, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think, you know, that's more than enough. But um, yeah, once you start going over 10, I think it's, you know, that's a lot. Um, yeah. And a lot of people will make fun of me because as well, because they talk about how like, you know, Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger sometimes, you know, especially Warren Buffett, he'll hold, you know, more stocks or other investors, they could hold 15, 20 stocks. And, um, but it's different because they own so much money. Like they're, they're forced to diversify. And like, you know, people like you and me and probably most, um, well, every viewer probably, like, you know, yeah. you don't have to diversify that much. Like, you know, there's enough volume and liquidity to just put a lot of your capital and like less amount of them. Yeah, into the better opportunities. Yeah, let's see if I had another question. I kind of, um, I think I already asked all the, oh, I was going to ask, yeah. Yeah, we kind of already touched it a little bit. If I think you kind of focus more on OTC stocks, if I'm correct, you prefer OTC stocks versus the um, stock exchange Amex. Knows. I don't think it particularly matters if you're in a group of trusted com uh, countries. Then, for me, it doesn't matter where the stocks trade. So it could be OTC, it could be you know TSX Venture. It really doesn't matter there for me. Um, what I try to look at is uh, more the company, a country and jurisdiction. So I try, <coughs> sorry, I tried to stay away from China as much as possible. Oh, yeah, um, sure. If you know Muddy Waters research, you'll know why. Uh, but China basically, <laughs> there, um, one of the one of the tendencies for Chinese businesses try to harpoon foreign investors, and so. Uh, there's been a lot of frauds that have been uncovered. And generally speaking, what you'll find is fantastic companies, just absolutely fantastic jump companies trading as net nets, but it's all a mirage, right? And so you just kind of, you know, at a certain point you have to say, I'm not good enough to tell whether this Chinese company is a fraud or not. So I'm just gonna steer clear of China. Yeah, that's and, no there's no reason yeah, to- and, uh... 
And so that goes with other kind of jurisdictions as well. Um, so I, I wouldn't be great investing in say the Ukraine right now or <laughs> Russia, if you could get in, right. It's seems a little bit sketchy to me and I'm not sure if I could trust the numbers or management or whatever. So, yeah. So that's, that's basically where I more defined things. Yeah, actually that, that, that kind of falls into my next question. I was going to ask, well, I'll name some industries and sectors that I like to avoid. And then maybe you can say like whether you agreed to all of them or if I, maybe I'm missing one. Yeah. Um, so of course the Chinese stocks was one as well. I never yeah. trust the numbers. The <laughs> auditors are always sketchy. A lot of them are, yeah. they have so many issues. Um, unless it's really big, big ones. Like I like, like Alibaba. I mean, I'm a huge, I'm a fan of Alibaba, but you know, it, it's a very different world when you're talking about yeah, Alibaba yeah. versus all the sure. net net like stock of the Chinese. So I, yeah. it's not a sector, but you know, a country. Um, I don't like pharmaceuticals, biotech, pot stock. I kind of separate them. Um, the energy sector, I tend to find that they're almost always at a huge discount. So I'm not a big fan of that. I think those are the main ones. Is there any, like, do you agree with those or is there another one that you kind yeah, of- Yeah, I'm a little bit more on? nuanced. Um, and so I don't throw the whole, those whole entire sectors. One thing that I found, sometimes you can get a situation where a drunk company failed uh, the, the stage three. And so they've decided to put the company up for you know, strategic situations. <laughs> They're examining strategic situations, which means putting it up for a sale. And um, you can find those as net current asset values uh, stocks. And if the discount's large enough and the management are motivated enough, often they can sell it for more than the company's um, you know, trading for by quite a bit. So that's one potential avenue for uh, pharmaceutical stocks. Otherwise, I don't know what the hell's going on with those, right? I mean, who can, who can properly assess whether a drug is going to be a big winner or not? Um, it's not something that I want to do. For energy stocks, I generally try and stay away from ex exploration companies, generally. Um, I like the picks and shovel businesses. So, uh, for example, we have one on our forum right now. That we've been discussing called Smart Sand, and it's trading at uh, I think a forty-three percent discount. Is that SND. To... Pardon me. Is that SND ticker? Yes, it is. Yeah, SND okay. ticker. Yeah. SND. Yeah, it's trading for a substantial discount to net tangible asset value, so not net current asset value, but net tangible asset value, and um, it's just uh, entering the point where it's going to be substantially profitable, going up to a cyclical upswing. So in that type of situation, I like uh, to, to buy these companies, but outside of that, not really. Um, I'm, more, I'm more like the industrials, the retails, I don't really like that much, but you can't be that you know, picky when it comes to net nets. Yeah, yeah. The, for me, you know, the pharmaceuticals and the, all the biotechs, I guess the only reason they, they scare me is because one, they have a history of diluting shareholders because they're always raising capital or right. two out of nowhere they'll just use a huge chunk of their cash to like i don't know to, to for something so it kind of kills the numbers for me so i'm not a big fan of, of those two things and, a lot, and you know a lot of the times it's hard for me to i guess know how to discount or what to do with some of their assets like things that they have in inventory for example um yeah. just, just little stuff that just kind of throws me off so yeah i stay away and for the energy ones um the problem that I saw with them was just the fact that they had a history of trading low. Like I would always find some, um, yeah. I, I think biotech and pharmaceuticals and energy are like the ones that I see the most, but I usually clear them all out uh, when yeah. I'm filtering them. But yeah. yeah, I guess my problem with them was just, they just had a history of trading like below their net net or net current asset value, uh, net current asset value. So, so <clears> I, I guess I would always just, I didn't like how I didn't have a target. Cause I'm like, you know, if they're always at a dollar for 50 cents, like what, Yeah. why would like, you know, why would I come in and now they're going to be trading above? So I, I guess I saw a lot of that sure. in that sector. So I just kind of was like, I'm cutting it off. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so for some of these, you know, there's a lot of net nets in Japan right now. Uh, there has been for the last few years. I've typically wanted to stay away from uh, what I call uh, perennial net nets in Japan because, you know, they never rise above net current asset value. But one thing I realized um, was that 
yeah, maybe they're always trading at 75% of net current asset value. But what happens if they go down to, say, 35% of net current asset value? Are they a buy then? Do you just consider, you know, 75% of net current asset value the target, right? That's funny so you said that because I did that with with uh, oil stocks. <laughs> yeah. I made some money with oil stocks because they were always at a dollar for 50 cents. But there was a point where they were like a dollar for 20 cents. Yeah. So I was like, well, now they're trading outside of their norms. And now I found value in that. But it was just that yeah. one time. And like, yeah, I mean, but kind of, yeah, I mean, just because something is a perennial net net, I wouldn't necessarily avoid it myself. Um, and then you have a lot of these Japanese companies and they're profitable year in, year out. They're just boring stocks that never trade above net current asset value. So if you can find, you know, one of those exceptional periods where they're exceptionally cheap and then just sell it when there's still a net net uh, after it's doubled, then I think that's, that's a good way to go. Um, it's not bad. It's not my preferred investment style, but, you know, or my preferred investment approach uh, when it comes to net nets. Um, I guess, I don't even know how much time, does it show me how much time we've done? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Do you know when we started? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like 1235. Um, I just don't remember when we started. So I don't know if we're at 45 minutes or 40 or oh, more. Oh, that's, that's fine. I'm sure you could probably cut it down too. But um, I'm an, I don't like, I don't do any of that. That's one thing I always tell my viewers. Like, if you watch my videos, they're like some of the worst <laughs> videos because I never edit them. I never put anything fancy behind like i don't waste any time on that i just whatever i got i put it up and they can yeah. <laughs> well one thing that we could talk about is maybe um you know individual approaches to what we like in net nets uh for me it's um i started off with these giant scorecards and i've kind of simplified it over time and i basically come down to um three core questions what's the discount um is it stable and what's the catalyst and then if you if all of those uh if the answer to all of those is you know really good then that's an obvious buy so what's the discount you know obviously we're looking at net net so i like to look at something that's um heavily discounted to net net uh value net current asset value or net tangible asset value or um net net working capital something like that but even better if they're a net net and you look at the business and it's obviously worth multiples of net current asset value. So support.com was, you know, an obvious one. Yeah. Was trading, that one was huge. Know, yeah. Trading at 50% of, uh, of uh, net cash or something like that. And it had activists. Well, uh, um, the business value on that was about nine bucks. And it was trading for like a dollar to a dollar fifty. So I mean, something like that is you know fantastic. What was, what was the market cap when it was around one dollar? That's one stock that I made. Again, I didn't write it that high, and I think it even became a meme stock at a point. Yeah, but it did. Kind of, it did it. Yeah. Oh, but okay. Yeah, it, I'm pretty sure it was. That's funny. It, it was. It was really stable too. Well, it was losing money, yes, but it was losing less and less money every year, and it was going to cross into profitability lots of net cash no debt so very stable and then you look at well what's the catalyst and they had a team of activists that was working on realizing the company's value by getting back up to profitability that's awesome because you know if the company's worth nine bucks and it's trading for a dollar fifty and you got a bunch of activists working to get it back up to its fair business value that's nine bucks, right? So, I mean, that's an obvious buy. Plus they had activists for the activists. So there was an activist team managing and then there's another activist team, you know, bitching at the management. So, <laughs> so I mean, that's, that's perfect. I mean, what, what can you love about that? Um, yeah, then that stock, you said it became a meme stock. Obviously, yeah, it went up. Um, I think the first activist team was kicked out by the second activist team. Second activist team put their own CEO, did uh, look started looking for strategic situations, um, and then sold or merged the company into a Bitcoin miner or something like that. And uh, the stock hit nine bucks, or hit I think it hit over nine bucks, and then dropped back to two fifty. And then the meme stock crowd got a hold of it. <laughs> all the 
chips stormed in and and the stock went up to like 40 bucks so <laughs> yeah I mean, that's insane nobody could predict that i would have yeah. i would have, you know been able to take advantage of that but you the know, nine bucks was readily knowable i mean all you had to do is say what are other companies like these worth in the market right and then you yeah. look and you're like oh nine bucks right <laughs> I sold that one way too early. I always sell them. I buy too early and I sell too too early. Yeah. Um, I do have a history of that. Um, I know GameStop was actually one for me, but I could, I don't want to say it was a net current asset value because I did include a lot of um, intangible items into it just because it was very, it's a whole different story. But I think at the time it was trading like at $3 and I calculated that it was worth around six something. Um, so that was one that in the back end, um, I, I invested in a little bit and I kind of got out of it a little too early, but uh, again, the meme stock crowd took it and they exploded into like 400 yeah. bucks. I was like, sheesh, but you know, it had nothing to do with that. After, after it was six bucks, like to me, it hadn't like, didn't matter. One thing I find is that, you know, if you have some really, really good idea, that the company could be worth a hell of a lot more or be trading for a hell of a lot more in a few years, you really have to give management time to realize that value. You know, obviously they'll, they'll be working towards it or there'll be some sort of um, industry uh, event in the making and you just have to hang on and just let it, you know, try to realize um, those values or, or that market price. Uh, another one, you know, that, specifically comes to mind right now is um, Westel Technologies. And yeah. I bought this. 5G. You know, pardon me? It's involved in 5G, right? Absolutely, yeah. And so, uh, you know, it's Ju July 11th. It's trading for, I think, a 40% discount um, or maybe 30% discounts in net current asset value. Um, I bought it for 79 cents. It's gone up quite a bit. But one thing that people don't realize, everybody knows, you know, oil cycles and, and all that, but telecom cycles as well. And so there's, there's a equipment upgrade cycle that happens, you know, whenever we get a new technology, we go from say G to 3G or G to or 3G to, you know, LTE, LTE now to 5G, all these companies and all, um, you know, not just big telecom providers, but um, industry and, you know, hospitals and, and everybody, they have to go out and they have to upgrade all their equipment. And so if you're an equipment provider, if you provide equipment, technology, or you provide, um, you know, the labor or the skills to set that stuff up, you know, you're, every few years you're going to have a giant um you know wave of money come in from these uh all these companies that want your services yeah you so, don't participate in that little rush exactly. of having to upgrade and some people becoming your customers i didn't i didn't think of support uh, um i didn't think i didn't think of Westville that way and I, I remember i saw it and i liked it but yeah. it was one of those stocks that I just kept looking at and he just kept going higher and higher and higher. And I think he went to like yeah. over a dollar something. I think it's still at a dollar 12. Um, and I just never bought it for that reason. Cause I was like, man, I wish I had it like under a dollar and I kept waiting. Um, <laughs> well, in past cycles, it went up to, I think about 15 to $20. So, and 5G, if you, if um, you know, I'm sure some, some people watching this are going to know about telecom, but 5G, um, the amount of equipment that they have to set up for 5G dwarfs LTE. So it's like something between three to five times the amount of equipment. It's going to be a massive cycle, massive. So yeah, this is this is one that I'm holding in my portfolio. Yeah, <laughs> I need cool. to get into that one more. Right now, know. I've been, there's one stock, I guess it has a little bit of speculation, but um, I've been looking into Nautilus. Um, NOS. Yeah. Um, that one just caught my attention a lot just because they it has to do more with its history. Like I, I guess I'm in that weird stage where like a lot of these smaller stocks, like I can't be investing a lot of money into them anymore. So I have to right. kind of start adding more stuff back into it. And the one that caught my attention was Nautilus just because they have a history of being profitable. Like in the past 12 years, I think 10 of them was profitable years. And, and you know, really good net income and their free cash flow was great 
um, yeah. like a minimum of like 5 million or something. And the stock's like at 50, 60 million. And, yeah. you know, apart from that, like they, they just had too much inventory. So retail got too much inventory. So they're not going to be selling too much. So I, I just find it like a nice hiccup to yeah. where it got a little too oversold. Um, but I, I do have to include a lot of, you know, in like you know, not in hopes that they start making money, but like maybe in a year or two that they will go profitable again. They have their journey app where now they have a lot of subscribers and just their assets alone. If I think it's worth like one, like their net current asset value is like 180 something and the stock yeah. at like 160, 170. So, you know, not the biggest margin of safety, but if you add back just the real estate and like machinery and all that, even if it's discounted, you, you get like three something. So that one's yeah. something that caught my attention. I just have to keep an eye on like their burn rate. If, you know, they have any, com- well, they, are, they will have some next year. And based on my math, even if they lose money or like take on more debt, like they're still valuable. And I don't know, it, it caught my attention a lot. So that's one that I'm kind of keeping an eye on. That's, one that's thing, the one. Yeah, one thing that I, I looked at that one too. One thing that um, really scares me about that stock is, you know, the burn rate. Because um, they're losing money now, right? Quite a bit of money, if I remember correctly. And at some point, they're going to run into solvency issues, right? Or liquidity issues, and they're not going to be able to operate anymore. So um, that scares me about that company. Um, So I think I would want to see it, uh, you know, either reduce its losses or turn profitable, before I got into it, but yeah, I agree. It could be a big winner, but I think that it's, it's very risky. Um, just from my take right now. Yeah. That's something that's one of my bad trades. I, I, I have a history of taking on stocks that have like a, a little bit of higher risk. Um, yeah. but it goes back to the whole, like, I, I'm just, I have a huge stomach. Like it is not about like in my head, I can actually see it going to 50, 60 cents. And yeah. mainly because it, it did that last recession actually you know no one's buying oh, yeah. stuff and like they go yeah. like they really go hard so even me wanting to invest in it like in the back of my mind i'm like i can i'm already picturing it going to 55 60 cents and i'm including that huge loss but i'm like you know by the second or third year like with journey and like with everything else that they're doing they're gonna re- they're trying to kill that burn rate a lot yeah. um and, and they don't even have that much debt like their equity are the ratios are still decent like they can add another 35 million dollars in debt to kind of help operate for a little bit more and like it'll still be like fine um so I'm, I'm kind of again that's kind of why i said it's a little speculative because i'm hoping like, you know a lot of it has to be thrown in there but i can see them doing that and um and there's, there's more to it but that, that's one that kind of caught my attention but it's a little more risky like you said how long do you think the runway is before they declare bankruptcy or you know have to sell the company or something like that I don't know, but that's also something that, well, I, from what I saw was like, they they're, they are expected to go profitable again, but maybe like not this year and not next year. Cause next year, I think they're even, the stock's at like a dollar something. And, you know, they they are planning to lose like 70 cents on the dollar. Ooh, um, yeah. So like, yeah, that, that's the, that's the, the bad part. But I think after that, and like just taking on some loans, because I think they could also, you know, take on loans to kind of help with all that. And just throwing in there, I guess what I'm doing is I'm trying to, cal- I have the number of like three something. I don't remember the exact number. It's like 373 three something. And I'm trying to discount from their assets if they were liquidated, like an expected burn rate in going into the future. So like if they lose 60 cents right now on the three something and then another 70 cents like next year and then it stabilizes by the third year like where it's at and like the numbers were still like my downside was still very limited I guess in other words so that's kind of why I feel comfortable um I mean I don't know I'm it's a little bit newer for me to make assumptions like that um just because I didn't have to before now I'm kind of forced to look into things differently um that's just kind of how I'm doing it, which was actually a question I was going to ask you if you ever, if you ever do that, like if you're ever, you know, kind of looking into the future a little bit, like, you know, if their net current asset value is a dollar right now and they have a burn rate and you're like, okay, it, it could be 60, 70 cents in the future, like, and it's trading at 20 cents. Like, you yeah. know, there's still a lot of room. I, I do do that, but um hasn't worked out so far you have to have a hair trigger because you know if your model proves incorrect on the downside 
sure. then you really got to get out if you um or if they don't turn things around by you know some set date or you think they really have to um or people are just going to start dumping the stock and then they're going to declare bankruptcy then you got to get out so i did that with um <clears throat> advantage technologies uh which um i thought they could do really really well uh if they could become profitable but they needed to double sales and so it was a really <laughs> it was a really really tall hurdle there to try and jump a over history of making money or no i, I guess that's one thing uh, why i feel comfortable with nos because most times i avoid stocks like that but the fact that like they have a strong history of always being profitable and like even like the right. retained earnings is up like 160 million dollars or something like i guess yeah. all those things kind of add to my comfort of, of, of owning the stock they, they re completely rechanged their business so they were selling uh telecom equipment and cable stuff and then they went into sort of not telecom equipment like phones and that they still do that but they um ended up picking a 5g service company that sets up uh these towers everywhere they're not a tower company they just set up the towers right and connect everything um and so i you know immediately you know the light bulb went on i said 5g awesome um but they were losing buckets of money and so you have to factor that in and i figured okay well you know maximum they could do maybe a 5x return from here um but they could also go to zero so <laughs> yeah i guess the downside then, to you is just like not worth it <laughs> yeah exactly well, i i ended up buying a bunch and watching it and i figured okay well if they don't do you know if they don't double double sales by this date oh. then i gotta get out because they're not going to survive or they're going to dilute shareholders to you know to nothing and so uh, yeah i got out they're still barely hanging on and i'm looking at you know what i predicted in my model of the company and what they've what they're kind of doing in terms of liquidity and it's fairly close but um generally speaking i want to say uh stick to safer bets you know i want giant net cash and uh <laughs> right and a, a runway that stretches 10 years uh not you know 10 months so yeah yeah i'm i'm i do i, I personally do kind of get rid of my stocks breed a, a lot faster i don't hold them that long like i don't, i think for me um i always found it to be a mistake like if, I, if i'm planning to hold a stock over two years i kind of i'm not attracted to that just because i can go in and out of all these smaller ones but you know the, the cigar butt thing you know being able to take a final puff off of them and like yeah. even you know even if if some of them are just you know if i aim to make 100 or 150 and it only does like 40 or 50 percent but even me just doing that with three or four of them like i i i see a bigger compound like a bigger compound even after paying taxes like yeah. i was able to make more I, I pay a lot in taxes <laughs> but i was able to you know make a lot more that even paying all those taxes still left me with a higher net worth than if i just held the one of the other stocks a bit longer um, right but you know now i am entering a place where i'm like i i might have to start holding stocks over one or two years or three five years but maybe, maybe not right. five years but at least two years um yeah that would be that that would be the blue collar approach to net investing you get in you do your work you figure out the net current asset value you know uh it's stable there's something there you figure it can bump up you know 50 to 100 percent so you buy it and you move on to the next stock that's kind of like the blue collar approach i call it <laughs> <laughs> i call it value trading because you're kind of trading them but i because I, I always say value investing and you know people are like you're not even value investing because you, you sell them after like a couple months or a year but i'm just like um well the right word i think would value trading <laughs> like you know yeah. kind of trading them but their value the value is there um kind of like a it's kind of like an arbitrage almost you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean the the two prices are definitely the nectar and asset value and the and the market price and you're just arbitraging between them well i guess every every value investment is like that but um yeah, yeah. well i have to go because it is late down here but i don't okay. have a blast talking um man i'm down to talk again because i can talk with you for ever <laughs> yeah that'll be good uh yeah i'd love to do this again so just let me know
Yeah, actually, I have a, I have a group. Uh, oh, I have a Discord chat. I don't know if, if, if you're ever down. I mean, I'd love to invite you and have them ask you questions. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what kind of questions they'll ask. You know, a lot of them are new people, so you have to just kind of deal with some questions. But I think it'd still be great to have you in there and just kind of chat with them. And you and me can just kind of chat that a little bit. But yeah, it'd be yeah, great to, to choose a time uh, to do that if you're down. Yeah, yeah, no, that'd be that'd be cool. I could do that definitely. And for everybody, buy his book. I have his book right here. I meant to show it at the beginning. <laughs> I have your book right here, and I actually love how it feels. I don't know what you did to it, but the cover feels so nice. Oh, I I get all the books, and then I take a really fine grid sandpaper. I'm just sitting there for hours, just <laughs> the stars in the You're cover. Kidding. <laughs> no, <laughs> I I just left it all to the publisher, so I'm sure they. It, it feels. I've never. I mean, I don't books don't generally feel like this but i love the way it feels it's like a weaker i don't know i just love it yeah i love the cover book. though the cover art i think uh i don't know there's something about yeah that. Just... did you have anything to like to do choosing it because that the it just it's a i don't know when i that's actually what attracted me to the book was the cover art because i it just made sense to me i was like oh cigar buds and like the little whiskey i'm not sure it's whiskey yeah. um but yeah the colors and everything are just awesome <laughs> Yeah, I sat down one night with a glass of scotch and a cigar, and I, no. <laughs> but I basically I gave them some guidelines on on uh, on what to do and why to do it, and so um, yeah, I think they did a, a fantastic job on it. Just really, really good. Everything really, really good on on the cover and that. So really happy with that. There's a couple of mistakes in the book. I'm not sure if you found it. Um, I remember <laughs> no good we'll leave it at that uh they're not big they're like grammar mistakes or you know oh. punctuation mistake or something like that so I think I, th I think I remember one word actually now that I think about it because I quoted I was quoting your book on my website and I remember I I I, I didn't notice it but I the, the red thing came out underneath it yeah. um I don't know it was one word that just was I think I don't know. Maybe I'm Canadian thinking of something American else. Spelling? That could be it. What was it? Could, could it be a Canadian to American spelling? Because you know we we add use in some of our words, right? So like color, for example, it's, it's uh, in kind of like that. It was like, like it made sense, but it just looked weird. So, I mean, I just fixed it. <laughs> I just added. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I don't remember what word it is. I, I have to let you know what it was. So maybe that is the right way to say it. That, that's all I remember. Um, that's funny. You know, it takes you, you know, say a couple of weeks to read a book. Now imagine going through that same book sentence by sentence, trying to fix all the errors and make sure everything's consistent with each other. That's, uh, that's the big challenge. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to cut this after this part, but so for the viewers, it ends right here. <laughs> so I'll see you guys on the next video.